Welcome everyone. Happy holidays. Today is Thursday, December 20th, 2012. My name is Eric Glazer. I help lead physician engagement at Best Doctors and you joined our live physician videocast and Google Hangout and we're entitled uh, two major contributors to diagnostic error and how to avoid them. I am joined uh, beyond my esteemed panel who I'll introduce in a moment. I'm also joined behind the scenes by our producers Kelly Cleary and Todd Hartley. You may hear their voices in the background as we navigate our way through this new technology. Uh, if you joined us last month, you know this was our first foray into a Google Hangout. Uh, and if this is your first time, know that we're still working out some of the kinks. So bear with us as we, as we experiment with this new way of, of communicating and educating. Uh, for those of you who are new to Best Doctors, our organization's mission is, is tied to diagnostic accuracy and supporting uh, improved communication and collaboration between the physician and, and the patient. Our business model is to provide medical advice. We provide this medical advice as a health care benefit and this benefit is paid for and by large employers and sometimes health plans. And we cover over 30 million lives around the globe. So when a company like Pepsi or Home Depot offers the best doctor's benefits to their employees, those employees are able to call us any time for advice. So on chronic or complex cases, what we'll do to support that patient-physician collaboration is we'll, we'll take it upon ourselves to collect that employee's medical records, their lab reports, all of their medical images and we'll put it in one place and then we'll have one of our internal physicians here at Best Doctors write up a really comprehensive medical history and include the relevant images, reports and we call this our clinical summary and what we usually do with the, with the employee's permission is we send that uh, summary which includes lots of items that may not have been available to the treating physician at the time that he or she made that initial diagnosis. We'll provide that to, to the treating physician. But what we'll also do is we will match the case with a nationally recognized expert in the appropriate subspecialty and we'll ask that expert for an analysis of the case and we'll include that analysis when we send the clinical summary over to both the employee and the treating physician. And that, and that gives the treating physician and the employee a, a lot more assurance that every diagnosis and treatment option has been, has been explored. So as doctors, all of you are diagnosing every day, but we're guessing that rarely do you get to come together in a form like this and talk about the diagnostic process. And that's why we've assembled this esteemed panel of experts tonight, because we want to learn how our panel became great diagnosticians and then what lessons they can convey to us, what tricks and tools they employ in their clinic every day. It's a great way of learning. So we, 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 want, we want to actually engage with you as well. I know this is a one way, it's a video cast, but we're monitoring our inbox at physicians at bestdoctors.com. So we'll be looking at that constantly so you can ask us questions or make comments through email. And if you're brave and want to enter into the world of social media and use Twitter, we're going to be monitoring the hashtag MDChat. And anytime you have a comment or a question, just tweet it. We'll see it. And I'll do my best to incorporate your comments and questions into the flow of today's discussion. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our esteemed panel. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. William Bond. He is an emergency physician at Leahy Valley Health Network and he's the Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of South Florida, Rosani College of Medicine. He's authored work on patient safety, cognitive error, and differential diagnosis generators. Our second panelist is Dr. David Harrison, who is an attending physician at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also the Associate Medical Director here at Best Doctors and our medical lead in our research around the 20 years of cases and research that we're conducting around diagnostic error. He received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School and specializes in internal medicine and pediatrics. Our third panelist is Dr. Harold Lehman. He is an associate professor and the director of training and research at the Division of Health Science Informatics at John Hopkins University, where he's also the associate professor of pediatrics. 
And our fourth panelist is Dr. Scott Strayer, who is the professor and interim chairman in the Department of Family and Preventative Medicine at the University of South Carolina. His research is around diagnostic accuracy and decision making, and he's authored works. He's authored work on tools which aid in identifying differential diagnosis. And last and certainly not least is our moderator. So the good news is you don't have to hear me speak too much for the remainder of today's session. I'll be handing over the proverbial microphone to Dr. Mark Graber, who's one of the pre preeminent researchers on diagnostic error and clinical decision making. He's currently a senior researcher and advisor for RTI International and is one of the founders for the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. And Mark studied at Stanford University and his clinical specialties are in nephrology and internal medicine. So I'm with Mark, with that Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and let you uh, take it away with the questions. Thanks Eric and, and good evening everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, it's a special occasion for me because I love to talk about diagnosis. As physicians, this is what we do. We do it every day, and it's probably one of the most important things we do. It's the defining characteristic of a physician to be able to diagnose well. And yet we never talk about it. We never take the time to consider how we do and whether we can do any better. So that's the purpose of this chat is to have that kind of discussion. And I'm really looking forward to it. What I'd like to do is give just a very brief background about where things go wrong in making diagnosis, and that will lead us into the discussion with our panel this evening. Um, there's a slide maybe coming up? Slides are up, Mark. You just can't tell, but they're up. Okay. Well, I hope you can see it. Um, Mark, which slide would you like? There's a slide with an upside down triangle. Got it. There you go. Oh, perfect. Thanks. So this is how I look at the world of diagnostic error. It kind of oversimplifies things a bit, but it makes it easier to talk about things. So at the bottom is the patient going along his clinical course and something bad happens. And you can always point your finger at, at the physician who is taking care of that patient and think what went wrong with the clinical reasoning. And we call that the sharp end of medicine. And when we're discussing the sharp end, we're talking about cognitive errors. Um, I didn't put the case together right. I didn't have enough medical knowledge. I didn't gather the data appropriately, all these cognitive things. But also, there's the blunt end. This is the medical system in which we work, and this is critically important for how well we do in terms of diagnosis. So these are the, the two basic categories, the system-oriented ones and the cognitive ones. In the next slide, we can take a little better look. I can't see that one. Does it say system or cognitive? Todd? It says all of the system errors. Great. Thank you. So we analyzed cases of diagnostic error about five years ago. We gathered 100 cases. We looked at all the system things that went wrong. And this slide shows the top four. Uh, and Kind of interesting, the very one at the top of the list is communication breakdowns and coordinating care. And all the studies that look in patient safety find that communication breakdowns and problems coordinating care are uh, outnumber everything else. So this is in agreement with almost all other studies that have been done. Other things that we found were things like having expertise available when it's needed, breakdowns in testing and communicating critical test results. Everybody's familiar with those, and if you work in a teaching environment, supervising trainees is always a challenge. So these are some of the main things that, that go wrong in terms of the system end of things. And on the next slide are the cognitive breakdowns that we found in our study. Uh, and every once in a while, you don't have enough medical knowledge. That turned out to be rare when we were studying internists. They, they seemed to, to know what they were doing. Medical school work, thank goodness. Uh, there were problems with gathering the data appropriately, but by far the biggest problem is in putting it all together, the synthesis phase of clinical reasoning. That's where we seem to struggle. So tonight what we're going to tackle are two problems that kind of bridge both of these areas, both the system-related and the cognitive. And the first question we're going to consider is whether we can do a better job trying to come up with a differential diagnosis. 
uh, George Bordage has this famous paper where he's thinking about diagnostic error, and he says the most common reason is, you know what, I just didn't think of the diagnosis. So how can we do a better job thinking of the diagnosis when all the data is in front of us? We've, we've gotten our history. We've done our physical exam. We have all the labs there. We need to come up with a differential, and we need to include the real diagnosis in our differential. So unless you think about it, it's a setup for diagnostic error. And the second half of the call, we're going to discuss communication breakdowns. So both of these bridge the system problems and the cognitive problems. And let's start off with this issue of failing to consider the appropriate diagnosis. And I'd like to turn it over to, to, to Bill Bond, who actually studied some web-based tools that physicians can use to broaden their differential diagnosis. And Bill, maybe you could, uh, there, the next slide's coming up or taken from your paper. Tell us why you wanted to study these systems and what, what did you learn when you, when you analyzed them? Thanks, Mark. Um, Bill here. I, uh, we studied these, and it's fascinating that these uh, differential diagnostic generator tools are basically computerized tools that will take uh, physical findings, positive and negative lab findings, uh, some of them take uh, geography into account, many different factors, and then help the clinician by uh, supplying a list of potential diagnosis, uh, diagnoses that they should consider. And these systems have been around really since the mid-1980s. And uh, so you would think that by now they would be in uh, broader use, but, uh, but they're not. Uh, we, uh, we looked at four of them. Uh, we narrowed it down. We decided that we didn't want to look at specialty-specific things or things that were only about x-rays or only about rashes. We really wanted to look at the uh, general medical cases that would apply to medicine and pediatrics in a general sense with an undiagnosed patient. And so we took the, um, these four different uh, differential diagnostic tools, and we basically threw, uh, actually Mark, our moderator, said, hey, why don't we throw some of these cases at the differential diagnostic generators and see how they do. And two in particular, DXplain and uh, Isabel, uh, came out as doing quite well at helping suggest uh, the correct diagnosis, although uh, neither were perfect, and uh, they each had their, uh, their challenges. I think... Um, one of the main challenges is integrating these tools into your workflow. I think, um, I, I know I can speak from my personal experience in the emergency department. I have several windows open on my computer as I'm working. And uh, if I have to go to yet another window and enter findings, that, that is a step outside of my workflow. And it's amazing if you take uh, you know, several minutes to do something like that, that can really add up uh, over a shift. Uh, so I think that's part of the barrier. Now, some of them have been integrated into electronic medical records. Uh, I have, I've not had experience with using them that way, uh, and perhaps some of the other panelists can comment. Um, but, but these are exciting things, and I think uh, hopefully we could talk a little bit more, too, about I think uh, the very cutting edge of these types of computerized tools are things like... Uh, um, there's one product that's out there that actually scans the medical record as it's being created to help uh, with differential diagnostic suggestions. And then, of course, the ultimate thing would be Watson, right? The computer that uh, played Jeopardy and did so well. Uh, that computer, uh, artificial intelligence, essentially, can help also uh, with uh, medical diagnosis. Uh, so some things to think about. Um, Mark, uh, back to you for other questions, I guess. Thanks, Bill. That's great. You know, I was reading an article yesterday that in the United States, 75% of physicians now have online access and use an electronic medical record. So it's really jumped up a lot. And we, so that 75% has access to these tools. And the question is, do people use them? Maybe we could just go around the table. David, have you ever used one of these tools when you're seeing patients? Yeah, Maybe you have you. Start over, David. We got you on mute. Sorry, yes, yeah, so sorry. I was I, there. I go on muting myself. Um, you know, I, I must say that I I try to combine um, my own active uh, differential generation with um, having actually up to date uh, right on the um, right on my desktop. So when I'm I'm seeing patients in the clinic, both internal medicine and pediatric patients. I'm always running across things where I can't really remember what I should be thinking about. And that's often the source I, I uh, dive into. One of the biggest challenges, of course, is that one, it's static, and two, it really depends on me first 
generating a differential diagnosis to some extent before I go and dive into the resource. So really there's the only active intelligence that be, that's being applied is my own, which uh, sadly leaves, uh, leaves the, uh, can leave the patient in harm's way. So uh, I, I, I definitely am, am interested in utilizing more of these um, uh, artificial intelligence tools to be able to generate differential diagnoses more quickly. <laughs> Thanks. So you use up to date like a medical textbook, right? When you're seeing patients. Exactly. I mean, it's always it's always open. I have the medical record open on one tab of Internet Explorer and up to date on the other, and yeah. um, I can dive into it quickly. You have one screen or two? I, I just I just flip from tab to tab. Okay. You know, I'd like to make a pitch that every physician should really have two screens going. If you're going to use these things, it really makes a lot of difference. Big help. Harold, how about you? Have you used uh, any of these tools? Uh, yeah, my my, uh, my experience with this stuff goes back, back kind of a long time, because I was uh, my uh, my doctoral work was actually in Ted Shortlove's lab, where right. one of the first set of these decision support tools was right. created. And um, listening to the conversation, I'm reminded how we used to think that we used to have to worry that people were worried that these tools would replace physicians. Um, the the first tool was actually something called Reconsider by Scott Bloys back in the late seventies, early eighties, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's um, it's it's uh, goals was the very modest exactly what we're talking about here, just to remind you about things. But as we're talking, I'm reminded that the main tool that th that we use is Google, and I think any any tool that we want to compare and contrast the has to be compared to them. Uh, the last formal evaluation of these diagnostic tools was done by Ida Berner back in the 90s, published in the New Journal of Medicine, comparing, comparing DXplain with Internist One and a couple of other, QMR, and a couple of other tools that haven't survived. Um, but, what, but the whole business that you have to type in the findings and yet you can't integrate them is, um, is, is the real killer. Uh, our, our EHR does not let us have more than one window open because they don't want let us. They don't want to let us, by accident, be writing about the wrong patient. So it, we have a very constrained uh, environment. Um, so uh, so so I just want to remind people that we have to think about Google as the alternative. Watson is an interesting case where uh, it's still still not, they seem to be still training uh, Watson and exactly how they're training what they're training them on and uh, how it will be engineered to be part of the uh, clinical environment. So those are all big issues. But this business about being part of the environment, uh, one of Ted's earliest uh, studies was back in the mid-80s and uh, all his work uh, stood on, on the bookshelf because nobody could want to use it because they had to type in extra. So. So that's uh, so we don't so Google and up to date I guess is what I would say, say are our tools. Okay, so thank you, Scott. How about you? What's been your experience? Yeah, I, I think I come at this from a little bit of a different angle in the sense that uh, I've been involved with um, uh, information uh, updating tools and studying those, and I actually did a very similar study uh, uh, back in the a few years back where we looked at the various types of tools that help to update physicians' information, and then tools that let them get that information and pull it out when they need it. So UpToDate is a great example of a tool where you can pull information, and I certainly use it, um, but, but it doesn't really have a push component to it. So unless you're actually actively looking for something, um, you, you may not know that something is there, you know? And um, so, I guess where I wanted to go with that, though, is so I've, I've definitely tested out the differential diagnosis generators on a kind of a trial basis, and uh, we did some qualitative work on that while I was at uh, University of Virginia. Um, but the limitation, I think, is similar to what everybody else, what some of the other moderators have mentioned, in that if you have to type all this information in, why aren't we able to get this information while uh, all that information, you know, all of the medical record data is apparently, you know, supposedly codified, and, and so we should be able to be getting that maybe pushed to us a little bit. And um, I also think that that applies to the other things that I've looked at, like decision-making tools. Um, uh, I use uh, essential evidence a, a lot uh, when I'm faced with a set of symptoms, um, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm more kind of trying to uh, apply the probabilities 
that a uh, particular diagnosis is actually present. And um, But once again, having to use a double window, I, I tab through uh, multiple um, uh, uh, you know, multiple open uh, uh, explorer windows all the time, and um, I, I just feel like, and, and I'm not really aware of, of uh, many medical records that have achieved good integration. And I think that's where where we need to go as a uh, you know in medicine and with the electronic medical records. Yeah, yeah, good point. Well, I'd like to follow up on some of the points that you all made. Um, one is this issue of, of why physicians don't use these tools. A Herald made the point that these have been around a long time, and a lot of the early ones have died off. And, and, and everybody's touched on the issue, well, yeah, it needs to be easy, it needs to be integrated. So how do we do that? Is that, is that going to happen? Bill, what do you think? Well, it's starting to happen. I, mean, I think, uh, you know the challenge is is that it's the it's the challenge of electronic medical records, right? So some of the large health systems have have chosen a big vendor and have rolled out that electronic medical record vendor throughout an entire system, like the Kaiser system or the VA system, and that really makes it uh, easier to integrate a tool like this and and then uh, be able to encourage its use and uh, and foster its use. Uh, I think uh, the trouble is there's there's at least a handful, if not more, uh, medical records out there, and so for the vendors to kind of keep up with that integration is really challenging. Um, so that that's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. David, what what do you think? Is what is the problem? Why don't physicians use these tools more? Well, I, I mean, I think that William said it right off the start. It really is the amount of time people have and. It's difficult because especially with um, uh, the um, high-tech legislation of the Obama administration, there is the advantage of having a huge push of moving towards electronic medical records and, and, and having all these, these resources right at one's fingertips. But with that come a number of mandates. For example, where I practice at Mass General, so that we can generate meaning, you know, demonstrate meaningful use, we are signing patients up for patient portals, we're printing out pre-visit hand uh, handouts, we're printing out post-visit handouts, and there's a tremendous amount of additional um, work that's being sh kind of crammed into a, um, into a 15 minute visit. And so if someone says, wow, here is this great differential diagnosis generator, this is really cool, I would say thank you so much, but you know what, I have to meet my meaningful use metrics first. So I, I think there's tremendous opportunity but the thing that's difficult is that, especially folks who are in the emergency room or um, people who are on the front lines in primary care, they're in the midst of this tidal wave, and it's difficult for differential diagnosis generators of value to be able to kind of say, put the keep their head above the wave that's uh, coming in. Yeah, Harold, any any comments from your perspective on on why these don't get more use? Um, I, you know, as we're talking. Uh, um, I'm thinking about whether we know when, you know, we talked about different decision support is the right place, right time, right format, and so forth, and, uh, and um, I'm just wondering if we've actually done the work in figuring out when is the moment that people need this differential diagnosis or this reminder, uh, this reminder. I think we still have a model that uh, that the medical student model, where you walk in, you do a history, you do a physical, uh, you do, and, th and then you sit back and uh, I think Osler had a pipe. I, if he didn't, he should have and figured out what was going on. And we all know from all these studies that you do the differential as soon as you walk into the room, and you need to be going through the list as you as you're working. So I'm not sure that uh, that these that any of these tools. Are actually fit the real cognitive workflow that we have. Um, there has there has been work on you know glasses uh, that can you know, that can give you a screen. There have been um, uh, certainly there's no work. Uh, there, there's been some work on what I call the informatic scrub nurse, which is the machine is listens to you while you're interacting with the patient and gives you the information you need before you ask for it. I like but that. I would argue that yeah. So uh, I well, I get yelled at for. For using, never mind. I won't really get yelled at before, but um, uh, I get yelled at a lot. Uh, but um, I do think that the, that that separate. So I do think that besides, 
you know, the informatics people have complained about the 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 technology under underneath the covers. Are you Bayesian? Are you pseudo Bayesian? Are you text based? You know, where's the machine getting the differential diagnosis from? Uh, but I think this other part about where it is in the workflow is something that we have not considered. And it may not. It may be. It may not just be the issue of typing, but the process of that internal conversation you're constantly having, and how to get a computer into that internal conversation. I think is another part of that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I, I would, uh, Mark. It's Bill. If I could say, I think. Um, as you integrate into the workflow, part of the problem will probably become false alarms too. That if if it is forcing you to check a list of many things that are really irrelevant, um, just like any any warning signal that comes through in the system, whether it's a monitor alarm or a computerized position order entry alarm, if it's if it's a repetitive alarm that is not helpful, then I think we learn to ignore it like we do any alarm. Right, and that's something we have to watch out for. Sure. Yeah, Scott. Any any comments from your perspective on why physicians don't use these, or what we could do to help them? Well, I, I mean, I totally agree on the targeting um, issue and the alarm issue. Um, it certainly, you know, I mean, I I clicked through multiple screens today of uh, drug interactions that were uh, probably not very important, and uh, you know, we, we just kind of get to ignore them, and and so. In our particular uh, EMR that we're using, that that's um, you know one of the one of the few places where the push technology is being utilized and it's not being used very well. So I, I think being able to study how physicians look at this, do usability testing to see what types of alarms, how frequent, or how best to place them, is incredibly important. Um, you know the the uh, cockpit designers for airplanes seem to have uh, for you know for airlines have seemed to figure that out and and so we need to kind of apply that same uh, rigor to what we're doing uh, so that uh, you know appropriate uh, suggestions are given when there is the potential for a higher potential for diagnostic error um, when there is an appropriate uh, decision making tool there aren't that many decision making tools that can be applied that have been validated and so you know for the handful that are out there uh, being able to at least present them as an option uh, it, when when a particular set of symptoms is uh, appearing uh, you know perhaps from the intake uh, really maybe even from a patient driven uh, history intake so that there's codified data on on exactly what's going on with the patient and not not waiting for us to Dictate or type something uh, later, which uh, uh, it often happens. Yeah, yeah, good points. You know, the comments remind me of a study that our friend Dean Sittig did from uh, Baylor. He did a survey of physicians and he said, you know, we have all these terrific decision support tools. Uh, do you think they're good tools? And the physicians all said, yeah, they're great. And they said, he said, uh, do they help you? Do you think they can make you a better doctor? And they said, oh, for sure. He said, so why don't you use them? And they said, they're, they're, they don't have enough time. They're behind time 80, 90% right. of the time. So time is a big thing. The integration's a big thing. One thing nobody mentioned, and I'd just like to get your thoughts on this, do you think part of it is that physicians feel a little embarrassed using these tools in front of the patient? Or they think it'll take too much time to do it while they have so little time to be with the patient? I, I mean, I, I definitely agree that uh, many many physicians probably are embarrassed. They may think that uh, patients uh, view them as kind of fumbling along and, and not really knowing what's going on. And I really think it depends on how you present it to the patient. And, and we've done um, studies where we um, uh, surveyed patients uh, during the implementation of an EMR, and we were fumbling. I mean, we we couldn't even tell where the prescriptions were printing out, and and the patients felt like they were getting better care though because we were using an electronic medical record, and they were fine with some of the barriers to implementation. They thought they were getting better care that it wasn't being depersonalized. So, I, I, you know, part of that's a perception issue that that really needs to be further investigated. Boy, it'd be great to see. Um, see that type of study done with uh, physicians using uh, decision-making tools with their patients and what their patients actually think. I don't know if I've seen that, and it'd be a great study to look at. Yeah. Just, just a question. Think... Errol, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to, uh, you know, the, 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 the cohort of physicians being trained now, I think, are qualitatively different than anybody in the past. They've grown up with these machines. They're used to them. They, they 
you know, they live on their machine. So I suspect that that aspect of using gizmos as part of the encounter will be a, see a huge secular trend in the, over the next couple of years, and, uh, and that won't be as big a factor. Yeah, good. Uh, you know, I, and, and I also think that one way of potentially overcoming barriers is to look at multiple ways of integrating these um, decision support tool or these differential diagnosis generators into our workflows. So of course we're all going crazy in the midst of a busy <laughs> clinic session or in the midst of the ER. Many times people are doing things like writing their notes and really thinking about the patients a little bit more after the sessions are over. So if we can really work these differential diagnosis generators in an asynchronous fashion as well, so that when we're sitting there writing our notes, it's not just a process of, of the tedium of, of documenting everything we need to document so we can improve our billing, but that it really is a time of thinking about the patient. If we can then easily reach out to a differential diagnosis generator, press on a couple of buttons, and have it assist us so that then that next time when we see the patient, we know what we need to order additionally or what we need to have, that will be a way that I think will be um, much more tenable for physicians who right now are feeling overwhelmed by the many tasks they need to perform in a short amount of time. Right. Hey, Mark, Mark uh, let me, I want to ask a follow-up question as having the honor of being the only non-MD here. You, and, you helped co-author a, uh, a survey that we just, we just released that got about 1,300 physician respondents. And when asked what was the biggest cause of, of, of diagnostic error, the vast majority of them tied their answers to not enough time with the patient, lack of information, uh, so, some sort of gap. So how is a diagno how is a tool, let's say like Isabel, uh, going to be more effective if there's missing information or you don't have enough time with the patient to get the intake that you need? And why aren't we talking about tools that could potentially improve the gap in information, improve the ability to take an intake? I know that was talked about a little bit at the meeting that uh, you helped uh, run the Diagnostic Area Medicine Conference back in November. And what does the panel think about tools that are being used, or have you seen any tools that are being used to help in, in, in the patient intake or improving the efficiency of the patient intake? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's something that surveys the, the, the patient prior to their arrival or in the waiting room. I don't know, but I want to put that out for the panel because that's a big, that's a big sort of source of misdiagnosis, at least according to physicians when we polled them. Well, I'll, so I'll get, start off the discussion here. here. The, the, uh, it's been very disappointing to me that personal health records haven't taken off more. If, mm. if personal health records were adopted in, a, in some widespread fashion, that would pre-populate a lot of the information that you need to gather at the patient encounter. And people just don't do it. So we have to start from scratch at every visit and, and go over, well, what medicines are you on? And all these things that right. could be done in advance. It, what, I, I'd love to ask so a the, question of everybody, though. What, so what it, why aren't those taking off? Because I, I know that, for example, we've been de developing algorithms to ask questions about behavior change. For example, where, where someone is with their smoking and how it you know, tied it into a motivational intervention. And, and you know, typically we think of the doctor actually giving that intervention and, and making, uh, you know, asking the questions and so on. But honestly, a lot of that can be put into an algorithm. The patient can answer it. The, they can come in, and you, you can have a very good sense of where they're at. Um, you know, it seems like with interactive voice technology, um, certainly with computers and email and texting and all those things, that we really sh should be there. We or we certainly have the potential to be there. Um, I, I see it as maybe part of it is the EMRs themselves haven't advanced enough to be able to 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 uh, you know hook on to some of these uh, potentially helpful technologies that would really get us there and be able to use these. I, I'll also say that there is um, there's a lot obviously being done with technology, but if people look at the patient-centered medical home, which is really uh, uh, what many people see as potentially either the wave of the future or at least the wave of, of the next couple of years, um, it might not necessarily be technology that's pre-populating this information, but having people who aren't the physician 
a medical right. assistant, a nurse practitioner, do this kind of work so that then the position can be freed up. And right. um, I, I, I had the pleasure of, of enjoying that um, yesterday when I went for my first physical exam in 10 years at Mass General's um, uh, uh, Ambulatory Practice of the Future where I checked in at an automated kiosk and then um, the medical assistant sat with me with two big flat screens so I could see everything she was typing and she sat with me for you know 25 minutes and took a medical history and then the physician had another 45 minutes to sit with me to uh, take more history and do a physical. That I, I don't know that that's the future that a lot of us experience but again this, this, uh, this idea of not only using technology but also um, leveraging human brain power outside of the physician, you know, the, the, the physician realm to, to do what, to help physicians do what they do better is something we'll be seeing more and more. And I think something that will be very powerful is that if we can wed that kind of human brain power with the kind of um, uh, uh, technology that we're talking about. Yeah. That's, well, that's something, Mark, if I may, Bill here, uh, to comment on. I think... Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I li that I work in a world where I it's a big emergency department. There's often four pods running simultaneously with four attending emergency physicians, and so uh, I can walk next door to the to the pod next door and and uh, say, hey, can you come over and look at this rash and give me a second opinion? And I've I've found patients to be very appreciative. They don't think any any less of you, and I think that. Um, with uh, with telemedicine now, it would be easy enough for me to take a camera into the room and get, you know, Mark Graber's opinion on on what he thinks of that rash from you know states away, and I think that um, we really, I think the the billing and health policy blockages to using telemedicine more are preventing. I mean, the technology for I mean, look at what we're doing tonight. I mean, the technology has been there for probably at least five, ten years, and yet the policy has not sort of caught up with, uh, uh, with, with what we can do. Yeah. Well, listen, Bill, you don't want me looking at your rash. I'm a nephrologist. <laughs> thanks so much for that segue because it, it, it leads us into our second uh, discussion topic for tonight, and that is communication. So what we've been talking about is going to the medical literature and using these online resources. But well, let's talk about going to our colleagues and our peers or getting consultants. What's new in that area in terms of uh, can we do it better these days? And do you take advantage of that? And how do you take advantage of it? I don't know. Scott, how, any, any thoughts on that? You know what? I actually just missed that question. <laughs> so can you repeat it? Yeah, we're talking about communication with our peers and with our mm -hmm. colleagues as a way to improve diagnosis. Now, how often do we do that? Should we do it more often? And what tools are available these days that would facilitate that? Yeah, I actually I absolutely agree that the communication uh, part is so key. And um, unfortunately, you know, we've been talking about the time crunch that we all experience and, and, all, and a lot of new technology that we're all grappling with the new electronic medical records and uh, all of the things we wish we had and, and, and some of us use uh, simultaneously like the having up to date open or having uh, Isabel uh, in a different window. Um, so sometimes it really doesn't uh, give you the time <laughs> to communicate like you'd like to and uh, uh, you know I love the idea of telemedicine. We do a, a, a large amount of telemedicine in South Carolina for example with psychiatry and trying to make sure that uh, psychiatric care is accessible throughout the state and so there's a, a large statewide program for that um, and, and, and so you know being able to use those types of things and integrate them into the workflows I think are what is maybe uh, kind of missing is how, how do you put that into the workflow? How, how could we have something like this, like Google Plus, running uh, when we needed it or be able to reach out to one of our peers while, while, we, while we have a question uh, or want to show a picture of a rash? Uh, uh, you know, of course, Google Plus would be uh, probably, um, you know, it wouldn't be secure enough and there, we wouldn't be able to uh, share patient, uh, you know, information. So, so that would be one of the barriers. So being able to have those things built into the systems would, would be ideal and, and uh, being able to incorporate them into our workflows. Yeah, good. Daryl, comments? Yeah, it's, uh, just something that comes to mind, a couple of things. One is, is there is work on microblogging, NGH in particular, and I, I forget the people's names, but making making a small network 
uh, uh, a computer-based network, a communication network around the patient who's been admitted to the hospital, so that everybody. And you know, we've been focusing a lot on the on the doctors, but uh, God forbid there are other members of the team that have some ideas about diagnoses. Um, so everybody can contribute to that to that uh, community. Uh, um, and uh, so that's one thing is that th that can be supported, but but it but what we're saying now also ties to what we said before, you know the EMR is a billing system and a documentation system. It's not a system to help you think, and we're talking here about how can the what can we do to help uh, physicians think better, um, and uh, any ideas that we can get both from our listeners and from the literature on. Uh, what thinking goes on and how can it be put in? Uh, uh, you know, there is no meaningful use criteria about thinking, right? Mm -hmm. There is no quality metric on thinking. There's no place really to say what am I thinking and what do I need to understand? And so none of that is supported. And so the communication that we're talking about is part of, again, the cognitive workflow. And I want to continue the point that Mark made before. Um, and I do think that that there is a need to define that more explicitly uh, and to, to get, get, create some uh, specifications, functional specs, something that somebody will take, pay attention to them. And also, just lastly, I'll make a little plug for education. Uh, nobody cares about education. It's not supported. It's not discussed. It's not funded. It's not a specification of any EMR. Um, and at some point, we might want to think about the relationship between this sort of thinking that we're talking about with differential diagnoses and education, self-education, continuing education, and that whole part that doesn't generally get uh, discussed. Yeah, good point. Flame off. Yeah. Thank you. David? Yeah, so this, I think Scott's point about how, about the challenge of not necessarily being able to share this kind of information securely is so important and this is actually something that we're working on very actively at Best Doctors. We're putting together a physician portal where the, the company actually acquired a, a software platform um, initially developed in Spain but where um, the security is in place that it meets HIPAA standards and that information not only text and, and curbsides and, and blogs can be put on but photographs and DICOM images Icon images can be automatically de-identified. And what that allows for, again, is that kind of asynchronous consultation. And, and it's something that we do all the time. But realize that if we just write an email to one of our colleagues, we're already putting our questions in a very, very fine focus and already putting it through a lens, which could lead things astray. You know, we had a recent case where someone had been, a 30-year-old, had um, bad fevers and diarrhea and some weight loss and had a Prometheus plant panel that was positive for suggestive of IBD and everyone was thinking IBD. Well, when we went and gathered all the information presented to experts, we also found that he was having more con difficulties with concentration and cognitive problems and a lot of arthralgias and two expert reviewers in infectious disease and GI independently said, hey, you know what, this is Whipple's disease. So if I looked at that case and just focused on a couple of data points, I wouldn't have had my differential diagnosis be broad enough. So the ability to put a lot of this data securely so that there could be asynchronous review is something that can greatly um, support the same kind of synchronous real-time uh, telemedicine that people are using all around the country now. Yeah, good points. You, you know, there's really nothing more powerful than having fresh eyes take a look at a case to find errors. And I, I think to the extent that we can get our peers or somebody to give us a second opinion, it's just really valuable in terms of improving diagnosis. There's a cost, but there's a tremendous benefit in, in cases where you're not sure what's going on or where you, you think somebody else's expertise would be helpful. Yeah, Bill, you started off the discussion on communication. Maybe we, we circle back to you. Did you have any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I agree with the points that were made. I think, you know, the HIPAA HIPAA has been a double-edged sword in terms of uh, both protecting and sometimes hindering the flow of information. I think, uh, you know, we're just now, I mean, I think, you know, patients and the lay public tend to think we're so advanced with electronic medical records 
but um, but really, we're just now getting med, med reconciliation, medicine re reconciliation across the inpatient and outpatient uh, chastity. So it, it seems like uh, we should be further along than that. But uh, but sometimes those basic things uh, we're still waiting for. Um, and communications breakdowns, I think, uh, you know, can take so many uh, so many different forms. I think uh, it's everything from the fatigue and emotional state of the various providers involved and, and that impact on communication. I think um, there's the issue of biasing people, uh, you know, sort of biasing them one way or the other uh, in, ter in terms of the, the way something is presented. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things we could talk about there. Yeah, thanks. You know, in the olden days when we wanted to get a consult, we'd send it off to a colleague and the patient would make an appointment and go see them and that would happen sometime in the future. So it seems like what everybody's talking about is trying to to speed that up and maybe even make it in real time if you can. You mentioned the example, Bill, of like just going to the next curtain and talking to the person who's there. Um, I just wonder how many of our practices are set up like that where we could take advantage of that or do we have to rely on other communication pathways besides person-to-person -person communication. Does anybody have a colleague next door that they can go talk to? How often do you do that? <laughs> well, I, you know, you ever do that? I, I'm in a residency setting, so uh, not only do I have 30, you know, colleagues <laughs> asking me questions every day, but, but uh, you know, also have the opportunity to ask my other colleagues. But, but honestly, even, even in that, that rich environment, you know, learning, uh, you know, uh, uh, environment, it, it, it's still, I still don't have as much time as I'd like to be able to ask some of those questions and, and certainly being able to do it um, asynchronously and, and be able to have the key elements of a case uh, uh, in, a, in a platform uh, similar to, to um, uh, what you guys were describing uh, would be, I think, would be ideal. One of the, one of the um, uh, researchers that I work with with, uh, who's up in uh, Canada, Roland Grad, um, actually has designed a cognitive impact um, assessment method, basically, where um, when uh, physicians are being pushed information, and you know, this is getting back to the pushed information piece that I've been looking at, where they actually rate the impact of what a particular push uh, has. And so you can see across several hundred if not thousands of physicians, what actually has an impact? It, you know, is, is the latest new information about Zithromax or Tyotropian or something like that, does that actually have the impact? And so it, it, it kind of made me start thinking about, wow, if, if, if people had some way of even doing that with the cases, as they're writing up a case, um, you know, uh, some sort of uh, assessment where this is a question that a lot of physicians are having. What what is this? And and being able to um, uh, get you know get larger samples of how many people are having these questions, I think would be uh, very powerful. Yeah, good points. You know, you you mentioned working with the residents, and I think they're much better at it than we are in terms of sharing thoughts with each other. And I wonder, sure. part of it is you know this cultural thing that is. Physicians were a little overconfident. We're, we we don't want to you know go to somebody else because it'll make us look bad. I think mm -hmm. we'd be better off if we get past that and go back to the the system where we really openly communicated and got input from others. I I, I agree, and I think one other issue is that it's very important if we are going to broaden the net beyond just the person who's in the next pod in the ER or in the next office in the outpatient clinic. We really need to trust the person we're curbsiding, the person we're reaching out to. And I think that sometimes that might, you know, as we all know, there are a lot of online communities, some you know, very well populated like Sermo, where physicians can go and post questions and, and seek mm -hmm. curbsides. But I think the thing that's difficult is that people can respond anonymously or other, you know, folks can respond and it's hard to know if they're really coming from a position of knowledge authority. Again, that's why we're really hoping with this physician portal we're putting together with Best Doctors, you know, all the people who are listening to the webinar, the people here, have, uh, have a certain degree of, of authority because of their, nomin you know, their peer nomination to the Best Doctors Expert Network. So the hope is that if we are facing a challenging patient, and we can go and synthesize what our key questions are and what the key information is, 
we can present that and then get feedback we can really count on and really trust and, and hopefully that'll provide a degree of authority that something like up to date might have that we like um, that's also dynamic in the way that something like Yahoo Answers or something like that would be but where we don't necessarily have the same confidence in the content. Yeah, thanks, David. Listen, before I forget, Eric mentioned a really interesting survey that Best Doctors just completed about diagnostic error. And uh, for anyone who would like to see that, you can get to that via a link that Eric is going to put up on the Google Plus page and on the YouTube page. And there's a survey there, too, where you can provide your feedback on, on tonight's conference and whatever else you'd like to tell us about. Um, Harold. Any final comments on on peer to peer communication and what we can do to improve that? Yeah, we need we need simply to double the number of hours in the day, and we'll be full. We'll, we'll yeah, <laughs> time is yeah, everything, but, isn't it? Right, but I, you know, if if somehow the we could have a an ad hoc network that you simply you know you use your your telecommunicator like in Star Trek and ask a question, and the answer gets you know you get an answer out of the ether. That would be, you know, that would be very nice. But uh, I think we're we're not up to, we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, but I, I can't let it go. Harold brought up using Google earlier on in the discussion, and I just have to say, from my perspective, Google is a really lousy tool for physicians to use, especially in terms of differential diagnosis. Uh, it's actually been studied. The the sensitivity of Google in finding the real diagnosis is about sixty percent as compared to the search engines that, that build study, which are over 90% or over 95%. And Google has an even worse specificity problem than these, these specialized differential diagnosis search engines. So I don't want people to go away with the idea that we're in favor of Google. What we'd like to see is people use these more sophisticated tools and, and take advantage of evidence-based resources. Harold, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, I, I appreciate the the, uh, the 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 response. Um, I wasn't saying that I advocate Google. I was just saying that that's what people use. Yes. And therefore, and and therefore, and be, because the per, we don't want the perfect. They're saying they don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, and because workflow is so important, they will sacrifice a lot of sensitivity and specificity in order to see what they see as valuable. So that that's a big challenge. For these other sources, in terms of EBM resources, I just want to make a point that we've been mentioning up to date a lot, uh, and um, I w would want to make sure that our listeners know about or use Guideline.gov and Cochrane, since those are again high quality evidence based resources, but again not as user friendly as uh, as up to date. Well, and one thing I would add to that uh, too, Harold, is is just that um, the sources that we are using, because there are multiple sources out there, we we need to make sure that they're including uh, very um, uh, highly relevant and valid sources, such as Cochrane, for example. So if you're if you're looking something up, even if it's an up to date or wherever it is, you want to make sure that it's pulling in any any relevant um, studies out of the Cochrane, because uh, you know if it's been answered there. Uh, that's kind of the best systematic review and the best meta-analyses that are done. So um, that is an important point that uh, the sources we look at um, need to need to be comprehensive and, and, and valid. Yeah, you know, and getting back to the trainees, every one of them knows how to use Google, but how many of them know how to use the Cochrane collaboration to find good evidence? I think we could do a much better job teaching them to use those more sophisticated tools. Listen, we have about three or four minutes left. What I'd like to do is go around and get from everybody one or two tips that you would like to convey about the, your best recommendations for improving diagnosis. Bill, can we start with you? Uh, boy, it's a tall order. I think, uh, you know, there are certain uh, pearls uh, that really are cognitive uh, tips. So I think, I think uh, always looking for the second diagnosis is is sort of a quick one that I think of uh, at work usually, um, whether that's the second fracture on the x-ray or just trying to expand your differential. I like that. Yeah, good advice. Scott, how about from your perspective? 
I, well, I think uh, we, we kind of said it in, in this um, discussion in the sense that um, it, it, we have to be flexible and have to be using different sources um, and be uh, comfortable with being able to toggle between uh, three or four windows, uh, being able to, to stop and pull up a, a study that we maybe know exists and we're trying to show it to our patient or trying to confirm. I had that come up in my clinic today. Somebody, a lady was asking, she was very anti-vaccine, uh, but but said, you know, our, our, our pastor is telling us that we should be getting Verivax. What have you heard about that? Well, I didn't remember what the number needed to treat was. I didn't know how uh, much it could help uh, her, but I was able to pull that study up in a few seconds through uh, using one of my resources, Essential Evidence, and and find that and give that information to her. It reassured her, and uh, uh, you know I think she'll probably go off and get the vaccination, which I think is probably a good. That's thing. a great example. Thank you, Harold. I was going to make a pitch that all listeners should feel empowered to go and talk to their whoever is their physician champion or the IT the people who are in charge of the IT because. I suspect that IT folks don't hear that this is an issue, and they don't really know to care about helping the diagnostic process, uh, uh, and because uh, they're all wrapped up in the money. But so I, let me just suggest that you go and tell your your people that you know helping you think and know is important, and you would like those resources. Yeah. David, you get the last word on this. Oh, uh, what an honor. Thank you. I, I definitely hard acts to follow. But um, I, one, I would just say note writing should um, be actually a, a time when one applies active intelligence and uses that time when a, a little bit out of the fray to generate a, um, a, a really solid differential and act upon it. But, um, you know, I'd also say stay tuned in, in again, a shameless pitch, but really because I'm very excited about it, stay tuned to Best Doctors because we really um, launching this this physician portal collaboration. We're actually launching a collaboration with a, a really outstanding Nigerian physician, Dr. Ernest Madu, who's done tremendous work both in Jamaica and Nigeria. So that we're going to um, invite uh, physicians with boots on the ground in Nigeria to go and and present and post their their cases on our physician portal, so we can help them generate differential diagnoses and get to, to, to accurate diagnoses to help their patients. And I think that that kind of, um, that kind of schema can, can have a lot, of, uh, a lot of efficacy, has a lot of potential. That's great. Good point. Well, listen, it's been great talking about diagnosis. It always is. Uh, not only is diagnosis a challenge, but it's also a lot of fun. And to the extent that we can keep it, both of those things, a challenge and fun, and do a good job at it, I think everybody will be happy. So, Eric, I'm going to turn it back to you. Any, any final words from the best doctors front? Yeah, well, I want to thank everyone who's been uh, taking the time to view us, and a special thank you to all of you on the panel. This was terrific. Uh, thank you for your patience in experimenting with uh, the Google Hangouts. I, I think from a technical standpoint, it went, it went smoothly. If you didn't see the link that Mark was referencing uh, as a way to provide us a, a couple of minutes of feedback and request the results to that survey, just email us at physicians at bestdoctors.com. That's physicians at bestdoctors.com. Uh, we'll send you the link. It's a two-minute survey just to tell us how we did, give us some ideas for new topics, and, and you could request a, uh, a summary of all the results that we collected. We had about 1,300 physicians respond to that survey that Mark alluded to earlier. So thank you all. Thanks to Todd and Kelly behind the scenes. This seemed to go uh, fairly well from a technical standpoint. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to everyone. Mark, thank you. As usual, terrific job. Thanks to our panel.